Hello and welcome to my talk about the event-driven, preemptive, priority-based real-time operating system kernel called Super Simple Tasker SST. The unique aspect of SST I want to show you today is that it can be implemented almost entirely in the hardware on the ubiquitous ARM Cortex-M family of CPUs. My name is Miro Samek and I've been working with embedded and real-time systems for almost three decades, over half of the time at Quantum Leaps, the company I founded in 2005. My main interest is in modern embedded software, specifically in event-driven techniques such as hierarchical state machines, modeling, automatic code generation and highly efficient event-driven artist kernels like the SST. Regarding the prerequisites for this presentation, I assume you are generally familiar with traditional Artus kernels and the concepts like threads or tasks and blocking primitives such as message queues. I will also mention real-time concepts like scheduling, deadlines, CPU utilization and rate monotonic analysis. If you would like to brush up on these concepts, I'd recommend my free YouTube video course Modern Embedded Systems Programming specifically the Artos playlist. In fact, in place of an introduction, let me begin today with a few screenshots from these video lessons, as a traditional Artos should be the most familiar starting point to most people. So first, the primary reason for using an Artos is the ability to split the application into threads, also called tasks, which the Artos manages according to the priority assigned to them by the application developer. Each thread is structured as an endless loop, similar to the venerable superloop architecture. The essential aspect of an Artos thread is that the endless loop must contain at least one blocking call to the Artos because thread blocking is vital for traditional Artos to work. When the thread's endless loop makes a blocking call to the Artos, the Artos performs a context switch away from the calling thread by saving the CPU registers on the private stack of that thread. Then the part of the Artos called the scheduler finds the next, highest priority thread ready to run and restores the CPU context from that thread's private stack. The result is that the original thread freezes inside the call to the Artos. Such a thread is called blocked, because it stops progressing and consuming CPU cycles. Instead, the CPU can run other, lower priority threads that otherwise would never be scheduled to run. Now, regarding the purpose of the blocking call, it is always a request to the Artos to deliver an event. For example, a blocking call to the OS delay function is a request to deliver the timeout event in a specified number of clock ticks. When the requested event arrives, the Artos restores the context of the blocked thread, so the thread returns from the blocking call and can immediately process the delivered event. In other words, a traditional Artos delivers events by unblocking threads. Perhaps for this reason, traditional blocking Artoses are sometimes described as event-driven. This, of course, depends on the definition of event-driven. But in the common understanding of event-driven programming, as it applies to graphical user interfaces, for example, some Artos threads can indeed be event-driven, but typically are not. Let me explain, because this is important for understanding truly event-driven kernels. In most definitions of event-driven programming, it is understood as a paradigm in which the flow of the program is determined by events. But this is not what happens in the blinky thread, for example. The flow of control here is fixed, rather than being determined by events. Specifically, the blinky thread turns the LED on and then explicitly waits for the quarter of a second timeout event. When that call unblocks, the thread can immediately handle the event by turning the LED off, because it's the only event that can be delivered at this point in the code. The same is true after the second, three quarters of a second timeout event, which is handled by turning the LED on at the top of the loop. The thread structure is simple but totally inflexible precisely because the sequence of events is hard-coded. In fact, such code is an example of sequential programming, which is the exact opposite of event-driven programming. 
So a better question is, can a traditional thread be truly event-driven? It turns out it can, but it needs a particular structure known as the event loop. In fact, the event loop is highly recommended by experts on concurrency. For example, the article Managing Concurrency in Complex Embedded Systems by Dr. David Cummings describes the thread structure used consistently by NASA JPL in all Martian missions starting from Pathfinder in 1995. The recommended thread structure comprises the usual endless loop and the obligatory blocking call. But that blocking call does not wait for any particular event, but rather for all possible events. After an event is delivered, by the usual unblocking, the event type determines the required processing at runtime. This is what it means that events determine the program flow in the definition of event-driven programming. However, the most important is the restriction that the event handler code is not allowed to block. In fact, Cummings' paper is all about explaining why blocking in the event handler code is always a bad idea. The main problem is that a blocked thread cannot respond to other events, which can have real-time implications. But there are other reasons as well. All event-driven systems universally assume run-to-completion semantics, simply meaning that only one event at a time is being processed to completion. A blocking call in the middle of event processing represents a backdoor event delivery. When the thread is unblocked, the second event pops up while the processing of the first one hasn't been completed yet, which violates the run-to-completion semantics. And last but not least, while a thread is blocked and unresponsive, other events might arrive in its queue, eventually overflowing it. In summary, if you take the event loop and the blocking restrictions seriously, all your threads will consist of only a single, generic blocking point followed by a non-blocking event handler code segment. Yet to run such threads, you are using a traditional Artus kernel with all its complex and expensive machinery capable of blocking in any number of points inside the thread. As it turns out, the non-blocking restrictions in the event handler code allow you to apply a much simpler, truly event-driven Artus kernel which could produce the same preemptions and identical real-time behavior, but at a much lower CPU overhead and lower memory cost. Such event-driven Artus kernels are not new, and in fact have been used for decades. For example, the OSEC VDX operating system specification, used in automotive systems, described such an Artus kernel. The broad idea is to remove the generic event queuing and blocking from individual threads and move them up to the kernel level. The application then consists of event handlers. Please note that an event-driven Artus kernel does away with tasks structured as endless loops. Instead, tasks are one-shot, non-blocking, run-to-completion activations. To distinguish the non-blocking tasks from the traditional ones, the OSEC Artus calls them basic tasks, while the blocking tasks are called extended tasks. As you can see, the main difference is the lack of the waiting state in the basic task state model. Alright, with this background, now I'd like to show you a concrete example of an event-driven, real-time kernel called Super Simple Tasker SST, that works based on the just-outlined principles. By the way, all the SST code I will discuss is available on GitHub under the permissive MIT open source license. SST was originally published as a cover story article, Build a Super Simple Tasker, in the Embedded Systems Design magazine in July 2006. That original version of SST, now called Legacy SST, is still available and is provided for historical reference. Today, however, I will focus on the modern SST, and here, only on the unique hardware SST implementation for ARM Cortex-M. My plan for explaining SST is to first show you how the kernel is used, and dive into SST internals only as needed to understand the discussed aspects at hand. So first, let's compare the traditional blocking blinking implementation with FreeRTOS to the event-driven implementation with SST.
On the left, you can see the traditional blocking free Arthos thread function with a simple sequential solution to a simple sequential problem. On the right, you can see the event-driven SST task implemented as the blinky dispatch function. The function contains only event processing, as event generation and queuing are the responsibilities of the SST kernel, not the application level task. The SST task does not block. Instead, it handles two timeout events. The longer timeout 1 turns the LED on and requests the shorter timeout 2. Timeout 2 turns the LED off and requests the longer timeout 1. Each pass through the Blinky Dispatch function takes only microseconds to complete. An essential characteristic of the event-driven task, in stark contrast to the traditional blocking thread, is extensibility because adding other events as cases to the switch is trivial. Also, an event-driven task lends itself easily to implementing an event-driven state machine, which also requires run-to-completion semantics. As far as the main function is concerned, the free Arthos main starts the blinky task and transfers control to the free Arthos kernel. An essential element here is that a traditional thread needs an expensive private stack. The main function for SST is very similar, except the SST task needs an event queue but does not need a much bigger private stack. This is because event-driven tasks all nest on the common main stack. I will explain how it works in SST in a minute, but first let me quickly demonstrate the SST Blinky example in Kyle Microvision IDE and running on the STM32 Nucleo L053 board. The project is found in the following location. Super simple tasker, SST in C, examples, Blinky, Arm Clank, Nucleo L053. The Blinky SST task is implemented in two different ways, which you select by the macro Blinky implementation. Version number one is the one just explained. Let's build it and load it onto the board. As you can see, the LED on the board blinks as expected. Now let's select the second implementation, which arms the time events for periodic operation, as opposed to the one-shot timeouts as it is done in the first version. This allows the blinky task to be even simpler, because it no longer needs to arm the time events. Again, let's build, load, and watch the LED blink. Alright, a simple blinky works, but it does not really show the SST capabilities. It is provided in the SST repository mainly as a convenient starting point for your own applications. But to fully demonstrate SST, you'll need an example with multiple tasks running at different priority levels. You also need tasks that actually use the CPU, because the simple blinky task runs to completion in just a few CPU cycles, so its CPU utilization is essentially zero. The example application specifically prepared for demonstrating all these SST capabilities is Blinky Button, also located in the examples directory. This example is provided for several embedded boards, but let's start again with the STM32 Nucleo L053. I'll first build and run it, but this time with a board connected to a logic analyzer. I'll then explain the details and correlate them with the code. So here is the logic analyzer view, which has been connected in the following way to the Nucleo board with ARM Cortex-M0 Plus CPU clocked intentionally very slowly at only 2 MHz. Please note, not 20 MHz not 200 MHz, as would be more common for contemporary MCUs, just 2 MHz. Now let me make a quick run to see what's going on in this Blinky Button SST application. As you can see, there is some activity on the Cystic ISR, Blinky 3 task, Blinky 1 task, and the idle loop of the SST kernel. But let me set up the trigger of the button trace active low and run again, this time pressing the button. Alright, 
Let me explain what's going on here and how it correlates with the code. The Cystic ISR runs approximately every millisecond, which is configured in the bsp.h header file. This is quite fast for an only 2 MHz CPU clock. The Cystic handler calls the SST time event tick processing, which posts time events to the high priority Blinky 3 task and the low priority Blinky 1 task. The Cystic handler also performs debouncing of the button signal, and when the button is depressed, it posts two events to the medium priority button to A task. The order of posted events is important because SST will preserve that order while delivering the events to the button to A task. So the first event is forward pressed and the second is button pressed. When Blinky 2A receives the first forward pressed event, it immediately forwards it by posting it to button 2B. This, however, does not cause immediate preemption because button 2B runs at the same SST priority of 2. So the forward event is only enqueued in the button 2B's queue and Blinky 2A runs to completion, which is visible by the data pin 4 being turned off. Now there is an interesting situation. Button 2A and Button 2B, both with the same SST priority of 2, have events in their queues. The question is, which will SST choose to run next? Note that this is not a question of preemption because both these tasks have completed their processing. Rather, this is a question of arbitration between two tasks at the same priority. And you can see the answer, which is that Blinky 2B runs first. This is because 2B is ranked higher than 2A. You will see how this is implemented in SST in the second part of this talk when I explain the SST internals. But continuing with the scenario, now button 2B runs to handle the forward pressed event. Button 2B posts a work event to the high priority Blinky 3. This work event comes from the board support package and signals the change in the workload and period for the recipient Blinky 3. This time around, Blinky 3 has a higher SST priority of 3 than button 2B of priority only 2, which leads to immediate preemption of button 2B by Blinky 3. Now Blinky 3 runs and handles the Blinky work event by rearming its internal time event with the new number of clock ticks delivered in the work event, as well as setting the new number of pin toggles Blinky 3 will perform. Indeed, after handling this event, the period of Blinky 3 changes from 5 clock ticks to only 3 clock ticks. And the number of toggles changes from 20 to 10. But this is not the end yet, and the scenario continues. Now, after Blinky 3 completes, button 2B resumes from preemption and emulates the CPU utilization by toggling pin 3. This is apparently preempted by Cystic, but eventually completes. Only now, button 2A gets to run because it still has the original button press event generated in Cystic when the button was pressed. This event gets handled by posting a work event to the lowest priority Blinky 1. This does not cause preemption and button 2A continues to emulate its CPU utilization by toggling pin 4. This is apparently preempted by Cystic and Blinky 3, but eventually completes. And finally, the lowest priority Blinky 1 gets to run to process the Blinky work event posted by button 2A. But interestingly, before Blinky work got posted, Blinky 1 time event must have expired and got posted from Cystic. Therefore, Blinky 1 starts with a timeout event, where it emulates its CPU utilization by toggling pin 5. After completing this event, Blinky 1 is scheduled again to process the Blinky work event, which is quick because Blinky 1 only rearms its time event and sets the number of toggles from the work event. Lastly, the idle thread runs at the absolute lowest SST priority 0, so it is preempted by all other SST tasks and interrupts. Alright, this was quite a complex scenario. But the Blinky button example has been carefully designed to demonstrate and convince you that the SST real-time kernel has the following properties. 1. SST is a preemptive real-time kernel. 2. The SST scheduler is priority-based, whereas it supports multiple tasks at the same priority, 
like button 2A and 2B. 3. SST always runs the highest priority task that is ready to run, which in SST means a task with at least one event in its event queue. And 4. SST meets all the requirements of Rate Monotonic Scheduling RMS, also known as Rate Monotonic Analysis RMA. For a quick introduction to RMS slash RMA, I recommend my YouTube video lesson Artos Part 5 – What is Real Time? Speaking of RMA, the blinky button example is designed to dispel a deeply rooted misconception I often encounter that traditional blocking Artos kernels somehow have a monopoly on the RMA method and that event-driven programming is unsuitable for hard real-time. As you saw in the Blinky Button demonstration, event-driven SSD tasks can preempt each other, and in fact, such non-blocking tasks are better suited for the rate monotonic analysis method than the traditional blocking threads. The absence of blocking vastly simplifies the CPU utilization analysis, which is central in the RMS-RMA method. This concludes the first part of the SSD presentation. Here you saw that SSD has all properties of other preemptive priority based RTOS kernels, except SSD cannot block. But you should avoid blocking your tasks anyway, so the restriction doesn't matter much. In exchange, SSD is fantastically efficient both in CPU and memory use because it nests all preemptions of tasks and interrupts on the common stack. In the second part, you'll see how SSD works internally, particularly how it maps to the hardware of ARM Cortex-M. You will also compare SSD to a traditional blocking RTOS, so you can see just how much faster SSD really is.